Hey, don't church? Good, awesome. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Uh, God, we do want to thank you that you're a good God, that you have given us a powerful word, that your word is all sufficient, that we can run to your word, that in times of need, that by your grace, you've given us your word, that we might uh, run to you as little children run to their father. So God, I do pray that as we gather around your word tonight, that you would speak powerfully. God, we know that you know the situation of every person in this room. Though we don't, we know that you know every situation and you know us better than we know ourselves. So God, I I would pray that you would, by your spirit, do a miraculous work, that you would take hard hearts in the room and you would make them soft. And you would make distant hearts in the, in the room near to your spirit. God, would you be glorified this evening? Would you be lifted up as we gather around your word? Would our eyes and our hearts be focused on the greatness of King Jesus? We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you just put your hand up, please, if you love getting instructions from your parents. You absolutely... Tim Cook, your dad's right here. He's a pastor, mate. Put your hand up. Who loves getting instructions? I'm with you. I hate getting instructions from my parents. I don't know what it is, like this rebellious streak in me or the things that I like to do. Is I'm not the kind of guy that loved getting instructions from my parents, particularly my mum, as I was growing up. I remember that I had this particularly rebellious streak when I was about 10 years old. And whatever my mum told me to do, I never, ever, ever wanted to do it. So she would give me an instruction, really simple, like, don't play basketball near the clothesline. So what I would do is I would would grab my basketball like straight away and I'd head out to the clothesline. And there was this one time that I was out there playing basketball near the clothesline and I snapped the clothesline. And so I called my dog Ralph out. I was like, Ralph. And then Ralph came out and then I pretended that I tripped over my dog when I broke my clothesline, right? I was so rebellious. I remember this other time that my mum said, don't climb up on the bricks by the fence and because it's dangerous. And so I climbed up on the bricks by the fence as high as I could go and I fell off. And I swear to you, this is what happened, is I landed on a plank of wood with a nail sticking straight up and it went under my eye socket, millimetres from my eye, right? Another time, my mum would tell me all the time, don't swing on your chair. Who's heard that before? Don't swing on your chair. Yeah. I love the freedom of swinging on my chair, kicking my feet up in the air, that the wind blowing through my hair. I was young. I was very young. And I remember like leaning back in my chair and I loved it so much that I remember in our house we had like this other room with a TV and I went into this other room and I remember it really vividly. It was like 5.30 in the afternoon. I was watching like, like, like Burjo's Wheel of Fortune and, and um, I remember watching it and I was so excited about swinging, like leaning back on the highest chair in the house. So I, I got on this high, high chair and I sat on this high chair and I hid from my mum so she just couldn't see me. And I got so excited and I began to lean. And as I began to fall, I put my right arm out to brace myself. And I did not break one bone in my arm. I broke both of them, right? I remember at the time feeling so ashamed I tried to hide it. But I was like 5.30 in the afternoon, I was like 12 years old, and I just cried my eyes out, right? I just constantly, as I was growing up, constantly was doing things against what my mum had told me to do. I remember as a young person being really, really angry or apathetic towards my mum because I believed that she gave me all these rules in my life to follow because she didn't want me to have a good time. I didn't trust the care that my mum had for me, so I rebelled. I believed that my mum wasn't interested in my welfare, so I took it upon myself to do all the things that I wanted to do. And my my response to my mum was, if you're disinterested in me, I'm going to be disinterested in you. Is it not true that there are many, many seasons in our lives where we have these emotional reactions to God, his commands, and his love, where we believe that because we're not getting what we want, 
We believe that God is not interested in our welfare, so we don't care what he has to say. So we feel anger towards him because he doesn't give us what we want. We look around the room and we see people with a, a cooler job, with, with cooler hair, people that are better looking, and we think that, that God doesn't care about us. And then so we get angry or we, we get down right down the other end and we become apathetic and we say to God, if, if you don't care about me, then I don't care about you. Well, the powerful thing that we're going to learn tonight is that the Father, through the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ, has done everything so that you might know that not only did God love you on the cross, and not only will God love you in the future, but God loves you right now. And he has done and is doing everything so that you might know the depth and the breadth of God's love for you that I don't know at all what situation you're going through, going through, and I certainly don't know the depths of it, but in every situation, by the Holy Spirit, we know that God knows. And through His love and His Spirit, He wants you to know. He wants you to receive an invitation to receive Christ as your rescue. That you might feel like you're, you're blocked in on every side, like the enemy's all around you, that you can't see a way out and your only posture in your heart towards God is anger or apathy or it's this erratic obedience where we decide that I'm going to follow after God only if he tells me to do what I wanted to do already. But God is saying that you need to lift your eyes up and receive the invitation from Christ to receive him as your great rescue. And so I want you to open up your Bibles to uh, the, the, the book of Luke and to chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 14 through to 30. And I want to talk to you about Christ our rescue. And we're going to start off by seeing uh, a great invitation that we receive from God. A great invitation. So look down in verse 14 of chapter 4. It says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet, of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now you would be forgiven for thinking that this was like an ancient mic drop moment, right? That Jesus has come along to this synagogue and he's, and he's received this scroll, as was tradition. And he's stood up, he's received the scroll, he's read it out. And he's rolled it up and he's given it back to the attendant and he's walked off and then he's just sat down like they were supposed to understand already what was happening. Now that's not quite what was happening. What was happening was something a lot better. Is that in, in Jewish tradition, it was the tradition that you would stand up to read uh, God's word and you would sit down humbly to teach. That you would stand up to read about the authority of God's word and that you would sit down to teach in a place of humility. Now, we don't sit down a lot to uh, preach today, and if you thought that the sole application of that was that preachers need to be sitting down, then you've missed the whole point. The point of this passage here is that Christ is submitting himself to the authority of God's word. That Christ reads God's word, and then he sits down placing himself under the authority of God's word, as should we as is the invitation that God gives to us to place ourselves under the authority of God's Word. That God invites all of us to be stretched and to be grown and to change. And all of us look, look upon the world and we say, something needs to change, but so often we don't want to be the ones to change. 
God invites us to change and to come under his authority. The invitation is to come under the authority of God that we might change. And we know that we are a people that are emotional people. We are a people that our emotions often drive us. And I'm exactly the same, that if I've eaten too much or I haven't eaten enough, if I've had too much sugar or not enough sugar, if I've had too much sleep or not enough sleep, my emotions drive me all the time. I remember um, there was this one time when I was dating my wife, like we were just a, a boyfriend, girlfriend at the time, and she came to my house and she um, knocked on the door and I stood on the other side of the door and I said, um, babe, I'm feeling very vulnerable about what I'm wearing, right? I I'd bought, I'd bought a vest. I don't know if anyone wears vests anymore, but I thought that I could bring in fashion. That's what I thought I could do. I thought I could bring in fashion, so I bought myself a vest. And so she, she knocks on the door and, and I said, Babe, I'm feeling very vulnerable about what I'm wearing. I've had a rough day. So when I open the door, I need you to be kind to me because I've had a rough day. So please be kind to me, right? And then so I open up the door and my wife looked at me for one second and she goes, I hate it, <laughs> right? And that's why me and my wife are so perfect for each other because we're both prone to these emotional reactions. All of us like, have these emotional reactions all the time and we need to prepare for them. That every single day things will happen in our lives and we'll be prone to make these emotional decisions. So the invitation that we receive from Scripture is to come under the authority of God's Word. So that we, when we want to be stretched and when we want to be changed, we won't just run to God's Word to find the things that we like to hear the things that make us feel comfortable, but we'll run to God's Word to sit under the authority of God's Word so that by His Spirit, He can change us to be more like Christ. So Christ picks up uh, the passage in Isaiah and He turns and He reads it out and He announces to, him, to the people around Him sitting in the synagogue something quite special. See, if I was to read out that passage just as Aaron did from Isaiah, I would read it the same way that Jesus read it. I would say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So what's happening is that Jesus is saying in this passage that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and everyone sitting around thinks that he's going to teach the passage. They think that he's about to explain the passage. He's not about to explain it. He's about to fulfill it. So he stands in, air in front of everyone, reading out this passage in Isaiah. Then he goes and sits down and everyone's expecting him to teach it. But he gives, it them, he gives them this great, great announcement. Look down in your Bibles. In verse 21, he says, And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He is saying to them, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And it is true that throughout Jesus' ministry, he did these unbelievable miracles, that he healed people, that he made blind people see, that he went to rich people and he told them to give up all of their wealth. But if you only read about the physical miracles of Christ and interpreted them through this passage, you've actually missed so much. What this passage is referencing in this, in this uh, illustration of dark and light, it's actually referring to in the Old Testament, we would often refer to the people of Israel in their rebellion from God, if you're new to this church, if you're new to Christianity, you need to know that the people that followed after God were not always disciplined in the way that they followed the Lord their God. That they would often rebel, that they would often seek to live their own lives apart from God. And what we call that is living in darkness. And what we want to do by the grace of God is to live in light. But what you'll notice in this passage, people that are poor, people that are captive, people that are blind, people that are oppressed, they're absolutely and completely bankrupt to do anything about their position. If you are blind, you cannot change your position. You need someone to change your position for you. 
And Christ announces himself as the great liberator, the great rescue. That he doesn't tell them that you're just going to get these these physical healings that are going to last but a moment. But I have come to take you from darkness and into his marvellous light. And that would change everything about the way that you live. It would not just be for a moment. It would not just be for a week. It would not just be until you get a, a bit old and maybe you're on death's bed and maybe you lose your sight anyway. No, what Christ has come is to give you an eternal, eternal gift that changes your reality this day, friends. Living in a relationship with Jesus changes your reality right now. Through the gifts that Christ has given us, the reality that we experience is that we've gone from death and to life. When he says, when Christ says that um, he has come to proclaim the, Lord, the year of the Lord's favour, he's referencing the year of Jubilee. And in the Old Testament, Old Testament, what would happen is that every 50 years, every Israelite that had made incredibly poor decisions, that had lost all of their land, that had lost all of their income, all of their wealth, had a, perhaps even succumbed to slavery, Every 50 years, there would be this year of joy they would have all these riches returned to them. They would go from rags to riches, not because they had earned it. They were actually powerless to do anything about it. But through the grace and favour of God, they're able to experience the immeasurable riches of his grace and mercy. The absolute immeasurable riches of his grace and mercy, with grace and mercy, which means that it changes everything for who we are. And these things cannot be taken from us. It means that we are justified in Christ. To be justified means not only just as if I had never sinned, but it actually means that Christ's righteousness, Christ's goodness, is actually transferred onto us. So we're able to receive his grace and we're able to receive his mercy that when the Father looks upon us, he does not see, his, he does not see our sin, but when the Father looks upon us, he sees Jesus Christ. What a gift. We receive the gift of being adopted into the family of God. Being adopted into the family of God. I have actually physically been adopted. I know what it means to have no family and to be transferred into a new family. And people say to me, I'll I'll speak about my mum or my brother, and they'll go, which one are you talking about? But in my head, I know no other family. That's what it's describing here. To be adopted into the family of Christ means that you know no other family, that you are completely, completely a part of the family of God and no one can do anything about it. When I come home from work and I open my door, door, my little boy sees me and he runs for me because all he knows is that I own him and he belongs to me. So he runs for me. To say that you're a child of God is God's word saying to you, act like a child. How cool is that? Act like a child. What do children do? They run for their dad. They run for their mum. We can run to our heavenly Father because of what Christ has done, because Christ has come to bring us rescue and Christ has come to liberate us and he's also come to empower us by his Holy Spirit. And what this means is that by his Spirit, we are able to become like Christ and we are able to live for Christ. By his Spirit, all our old patterns, all our own habits, we're able to throw them away and pursue the pattern of living for God, that no more will sin condemn us, no more will sin restrain us, no more will we be condemned by our sin, but we're able to be liberated by the Holy Spirit. And we're able to live for Christ. So that means at work, whether you're, you're, you're working in a job that you hate or working in a job that you love, whether you're in high school or primary school or you're a retiree, no matter what you do, you are able to do it for the glory of God. That you're able to be salt and light in the world. That you're able to carry around this light for all the darkness that is in the world. That you're able to be salt, that you're able to make this world taste beautiful as we tell people and we show people the greatness and goodness of God's love. 
Christ comes bringing this amazing, amazing announcement that you're invited to be rescued as he comes to liberate you. He comes to liberate you. He brings this great announcement. He also brings a great objection. If you look down in your Bibles in verse 22, he says, uh, the passage says, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you do at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in their hometown. 2006 was a cool year. A lot of cool things happened in, uh, in 2006. Wheel of Fortune came back on for six months on Channel 9 for a little while there. That was pretty exciting. We won the Ashes in 2006. That was pretty cool. AFL Grand Final. The AFL Grand Final was won by a point. That was pretty cool. This other thing that happened, if you're uh, old enough to remember, happened with this guy uh, called Guy. And um, Guy was this guy that studied uh, business studies, right? And he was... Um, he was also worked as a taxi driver. And he applied for this job at the BBC. And he applied for this job and, and, and he rocked up for his interview for the job. And then somebody came out and said, uh, we're looking for Guy for an interview. And then what happened is he put his hand up and he started heading towards an interview, not knowing that they had picked the wrong guy. He went for an interview for a job and they started putting makeup on him. They started putting a microphone on him and they started prepping him for his interview, speaking about the Apple iPhone and uh, illegal downloads online. And he only clicked when he was live on camera. This is the picture that we've got of Guy Gomez. When he realised that something was happening around him that he wasn't quite prepared for, that he didn't actually have an understanding of what was really happening around him. And it actually blows my mind. Like, when they were putting the microphone on you, and when they were putting the makeup on you, why did you not have eyes to see what was happening around you? Why did you not have eyes to perceive what was happening around you? And I don't mean to pick on Guy. Like, my wife would say the same thing to me. Can you not perceive what is happening right in front of you, Carl? Does that not happen to all of us all the time? Is that we have such a narrow, narrow focus sometimes and and our view becomes so low and we need to look up and see what is happening. That is exactly what is happening in this passage. Is that Jesus Christ has come. You can move on to to the passage. Jesus Christ has come declaring himself as the Messiah as the one who has come to bring liberty for the captives. And Jesus, knowing their heart, says, all you guys want is a miracle. Now, this is not a sign miracle, right? They're not asking, prove yourself, uh, prove yourself by doing a miracle for us and then we'll believe you're the Messiah. That's not what's happening at all. We know that because if you look down in your Bibles, it says that in uh, verse 22, that they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now, I do not believe that that was meant as an insult. I don't believe it was meant as an insult at all. They weren't trying to lower their perspective of him. I agree with John Stott, who actually says that what was happening there was that they were trying to claim their hometown hero. That Nazareth was this really small community and Jesus Christ has rocked up and they've heard that he's been preaching throughout all the region. They were so excited about this Jesus. And when Jesus comes and and declares himself as the Messiah, their view is so low, so low, that instead of wanting a Messiah, they ask for magic. They want their little hometown hero to dance for them. And Jesus Christ says to them, I know the state of your heart and I'm saying to you, look up. Don't put Christ in this little box. I do it all the time. I look around and I see what other people have got and what I have not, what other people have achieved and what I have not. And I say, God, do something in my life. And if you don't, I'm going to hold back my worship from you. Does that not happen to us all the time if we're honest? 
We put Christ in this little box and we want Christ to do things for us so that our life can be better. And he says, I came to liberate you. Look up. I need to tell you, friends, that if your relationship with Christ is marred by anger or if it's marred by apathy or if it's marred by this erratic obedience where you only follow Christ if it's convenient for you, what Christ would say to you is, dear friends, please look up. See that Christ is so much bigger, so much greater than that. I don't know what you're going through, going through, but Christ is able and he has done so much that you might know about his goodness and you might know about his greatness. He is Christ the Messiah over all. Christ the Messiah over all. It's time to look up. It's time to look up. He brings this great announcement and he brings this great objection but he also brings a final gracious invitation. Look down in your Bible in Luke 4, uh, verses 25 and onwards. He says, But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. What's happening here? What's happening here that takes people that were rejoicing in Christ, rejoicing, to now this position of complete and utter anger towards him? Well, we've got two stories. We've got this one story where we've got Zarephath. And Zarephath is found in the book of Kings. And she is a person who is very, very, very close to being dead. She uh, is uh, living in this time of famine, great famine. She has a child, and they're both at death's door. And they receive word from God through the prophet, uh, Elijah, that um, he is going to heal them and that he's going to give them all they would need to survive this famine. If only they would feed him, the prophet, first. And all she has is this little bit of, uh, a little bit of dough and this little bit of oil And she believes in God and she gives over all that she has to Elijah and God blesses it and then God saves her and she is able to be well and they survive the famine. Story number one. We have story number two. We've got Naaman the Syrian. And Naaman is a a commander of an army and he has leprosy, right? Leprosy is literally your skin and flesh falling from your body. You're alone in isolation. It's an incredibly contagious disease. He's alone in isolation, and he hears that he might be able to be healed. And Elisha invites him to come and be healed. He comes, and he is told to wash himself in the River Jordan, and he responds eventually, and gets himself in the dirty, the dirty River Jordan, washes himself, and he is healed, and he is saved. These two stories. What on earth is going on in these stories? Well, there's a couple of very, very powerful things that you need to hear as an invitation towards you. The first thing that we need to hear is that both of these people were completely outsiders. They weren't part of the people of God at all. They weren't part of the family. They were not Israelites. They were not Jews. They were not insiders. They were outsiders. I don't know if you've come to church today and you feel like every single time you come to church, you're like on the outside looking in, that you're not sure if this is the place for you. You're not sure if you belong. What Jesus is saying is that outsiders are very welcome. In fact, I have come for the outsider. I have come to make you feel welcome. I have come to set you at liberty. 
I've come to open your eyes so that you might be moved from darkness and into light in the kingdom of God because of Jesus Christ. Friends, listen to me. There is no outsider. Every single person who responds to Jesus Christ is a part of the family of God. We also receive a formula by which we can receive grace. Step one, both Zarephath and Naaman recognised their deep need. Step two, they both received an invitation by grace from the word of God to trust in the Lord. They both responded in faith and God met their need. They both recognised that they were completely bankrupt to heal, to redeem and to save themselves. And God offers this invitation by his grace to all of us that we might turn to him. This grace-filled invitation that we might turn to him, declaring that we are spiritually and morally bankrupt before him. But by his grace, we are able to walk into his marvelous light and receive the immeasurable riches of his grace and mercy. Friends, Christ is not our rescuer. He does not bring things for us to latch on to so that we might be rescued. Christ is our rescue. It is the person of Christ that is our rescue because as we are redeemed and as we are forgiven, the Bible says that we are hidden in Christ. So as the Father looks upon us, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. And this made the audience of Jesus Christ, it made them so, so angry. It made them so angry that outsiders would be welcomed. It made them so angry because they didn't believe that they needed God. They believed that they deserved God. And there is a big, big, big difference. Friends, hear from my heart, we do not deserve God at all. We do not deserve God at all. If we deserve God, what that that, that would mean is that there is a process by which we work to get God. And once we have completed all these works, then we can reach out and grab God. And then God can be our magician and God can do all the things that we want him to do. Friends, that's not the story. The story is that we can do nothing to seek after and to find God's approval, that it is by his grace that he smiles upon you, that it is by his unmerited favour that he smiles upon you and then calls you to receive his grace. And this is the best news, friends, because what this means is that it doesn't matter what you have done or where you've come from or what you are going to do, that there's nowhere you can run, nowhere you can run that his grace does not run further still. God's grace is enough for you. You don't deserve it. You do need it. And Jesus Christ invites you to receive it. He invites you to receive it. I remember, if the band could make their way back up, I remember a a number of years ago when I first got saved, um, I went to the Sky Show. We don't have the Sky Show anymore, do we? Sky Show's been gone. Sky Show was cool, man. Like, it was was like, we'd go down to Elder Park, and there'd be like 20,000 people there, and we'd we'd crank on SAF. They would play like this music to go with the Sky Show. It was phenomenal. And I just got saved. And I remember um, I came to Sky Show and I looked around and I saw the thousands and thousands and thousands of people there. And friends, it just reminded me of the thousands of people that have this posture towards God where they've tried to fit him into this box, where they've tried to get God to dance for them. And their heart is now filled with anger or apathy Or this kind of erratic obedience where we just follow God if it's convenient for us. Friends, the news is so much better than that. The news is that we have this invitation to receive grace. We have this invitation to receive grace, to be set free. That though once we were walking in darkness, by his spirit we can walk into his marvelous light Friends, that is the invitation that Christ gives us and that is my invitation to you. 
that I don't know what's been going on in the last week for you, the last year, the last month. I don't know what's been going on for you. But because we don't deserve Christ, we are able to come to him by his grace. That his grace is sufficient for you. That his grace invites you to come to him. It doesn't matter how far you've walked away from him this week. His grace goes further still and it invites you, please, please come back to the one who can set you free. Come back to the one who can set you free and be free indeed so that your heart's posture of anger or apathy can turn to its rightful place, which is, friends, a posture of worship. That is the invitation. I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes.